Matt Emmons was a prodigy in the rifle shooting world. He joined Team USA and in his very first Olympic event took gold very easily. In his second event, he was up so far in front of the competition, in front of all of the other athletes, that all he had to do to finish out and close out the competition was to hit the target. And so Matt lines up his shot, he focuses in the sights, he takes his deep breath, and as he releases his breath, he pulls the trigger, and he hits the target. Not only does he hit the target, he hits square in the very middle of the bullseye of the target. He turns around expecting to see his score turn into an Olympic record at minimum, world record at best. But instead of a record, he sees his first place gold medal run drop all the way down to eighth place. Because yes, Matt Inman hit the, he hit the target but he just hit the wrong target. He hit square in the bullseye, one of the most beautiful shots in all of the competition. He just hit the wrong target. I've been a pastor for 19 years, and if I'm being honest, what keeps me up at night is whether we're aiming at the right target. If I'm being honest, it's, it's because the big C church for so long has done really good things that what's churning in my mind and what goes through the the thoughts of my heart is, God, are we doing great things, but are we aiming at the wrong target? So often the church and our our, our culture, my, my greatest fear and often my experience is that the church gets so sideways, becoming known for what we are against being known by our vitriol, being recognized as a group of people with overactive conscience and and, an overreaching sensitivity. But Jesus said, we will be known by our love. Yet if you ask the world around us, if you ask the culture that we live in, if you ask the neighbor that you live on the same street with, oftentimes we're known by being so judging. But did you know that behind most people that we don't like, which we could admit there there are people that we don't like, behind most people that we don't like is a story that we don't know. Behind every opinion that we oppose is a person that God loves. Judging is very easy from a distance, and we have almost mastered it as Christians. Loving up close in relationship is so hard. How is it that the greatest story ever written, the greatest story that we could ever tell and share has been boiled down to don't do this, don't do that. I, I remember vividly in a, in a student ministry when I was a teenager, we were at some retreat and the guy that was speaking was teaching and said, you know, if you want to live for Jesus as a teenager, then here's how you do it. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, and don't date those who do. As if following Jesus were just as simple as wiping out a few culturally, uh, morally questionable things. And I think over these last, gosh, decade, so many people have walked away from the church. But what I believe is people have walked away from the church because the church has walked away from Jesus. There are four chairs on stage, chairs that represent people in our community, in our, in our church family, people who are in the city all around us. Chair one with uh, someone who doesn't know Jesus, someone who doesn't follow Jesus, someone who doesn't really have categories for Christ. It's what is often referred to uh, in our day as the, the spiritual nuns. Uh, have no relationship with Jesus, don't really have any interest in even connecting with a church. Then you've got people who know about Jesus. You've got people who know a little bit about the Bible, a little bit about church, but just haven't connected the dots personally to them personally following Jesus in their life. And then you've got people who are Christ followers. Someone who would say, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. 
Yeah, I've trusted Jesus. But while they would say that, you can look at their life and you don't see really any change in their own life. They're following Jesus in name only, on Sundays only, on maybe even in that CEO relationship with the local church. They come on Christmas and Easter only. Then you have people who follow Jesus, whose life has been radically changed and shaped by Jesus to the point that every interaction that they have, every relationship that they're in, every decision that they make has been shaped by Jesus. This is the goal. This is where we're headed. This is what we want. And yet so often, this is what people in chairs one and two see. Someone who says, I'm a Christian and lives no different than anyone else in the world. Brennan Manning, author, says that the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. That the number one reason people don't want to follow Jesus, the people that, uh, who, who don't have any interest in, in a local church, in uh, this whole idea of following a God, the reason, Brendan Manning says, the greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who profess Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. So as we kick off this series called The Way, where we're going to unpack and walk through this way of Jesus, this way of Scripture, this way of God working and moving that shapes every aspect of how we live, the way that we lead, the way that we've done things for years here in this community. We want to make sure everything that we do is aiming at the right targets. Targets like biblical, targets like Christ-like, like authentic, genuine, real life so that we can fulfill the mission that God has called us to, to become and be that home, that home for the wanderer so that we can find rest for the weary, for the restoration of all things. And what we're going to be hedging this entire series around, what we're going to be building things off of foundationally is this prayer, this cry from, a old, from an Old Testament prophet named Habakkuk. And he's going to pray this prayer for his generation that's going to become a prayer that we're praying for our generation, for his time and culture, for our time and culture. And this is what Habakkuk says in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2, as he's crying out on behalf of the people of God. This is what Habakkuk says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Here's this prophet crying out on behalf of his people. But his, his, his prayer, his cry, his, his great deep desire is, God, what you've done in generations past, would you do it in generations now? God, what you've done with those people, would you do it with our own people today? I grew up in a very traditional church culture and uh, went to the University of Tennessee for all of my undergrad, and, uh, which is the home of this year's national champion college football team. I can tell you who's not going to win the national championship is Notre Dame. That was ugly last night, all right? We're going to just, I should have probably let that go. We're just going to, we're going to keep passing, but God bless them, Notre Dame. I went to the University of Tennessee, and, and growing up in church, my student ministry years were so formative in my life that I wanted to be able to give back and volunteer, and so uh, my very first week of college, I went and uh, applied to help out with the student ministry because I wanted to be able to disciple and mentor like so many had discipled and mentored me. And uh, being a part of student ministry throughout my college years was, was amazing because you get to see the, the great seasons of a teenager's life, those seasons when uh, they've celebrated that sports victory, those seasons when uh, they've had a great uh, a great musical performance where they were elected homecoming queen, uh, where everything is going right. But being in student ministry, you get to see the highs and the lows of life, those high tides, those low tides that we all walk through in a microcosm in a teenager's life. And I'll never forget the Wednesday night when we were at a big community-wide service and uh, there was a pastor who was brought in to speak at this revival service. And 
I'll never forget this teenager, this middle schooler uh, who came in, and he had just lost his mom to cancer. And the pastor was preaching through a text that's really become an anchor in my own life and in my own ministry and in our own family, a text that you're probably familiar with, for God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And as this teenager was sitting in this revival service, this big event service, the pastor was talking about this great text, but instead of preaching the gospel, he weaponized this text in such an empty and harmful way. I'll never forget, as he's just lost his mom to cancer. This pastor says, I don't care what you're going through, God is still good. And that was it. And yes, while it's true, it just wasn't complete. And and what this teenager needed to hear is what some of you may need to hear this morning, that wherever you're at, whatever you've gone through, whatever you're going through, God loves you deeply and your church family is here with you. Somebody may just need to hear this morning that God loves you no matter where you're at, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter where you're finding yourself in your circumstances today, God doesn't look at all of your achievements. God's not looking for any great spiritual accomplishments from you. God is looking at you and chooses to love you because that's who God is. It doesn't matter where you've been. The good news of the gospel this morning is that Jesus can see my failures of tomorrow and still choose to be my savior today. In these moments as a church family, when people are grieving and walking through the the crucible of suffering, we have to be the church that is with people, bringing this ministry of presence where we just show up and we sit with people. God meets us where we are, not where we pretend to be. And from that night on, I I knew that there was more to following Jesus than just platitudes and spiritual sayings, that scripture had something to actually say about life and suffering. And so I went on a personal journey in that moment as a college student. I went on a personal journey in the word to see what scripture really said, to see who Jesus really was, because up to that point, My faith was more of a carbon copy than it was an authentic, raw, intimate, passionate relationship with Jesus. Uh, Make no mistake, I could have answered any question in Jesus' jeopardy. Uh, I could have turned to any passage of scripture within about five to seven seconds because of my Bible drill training. Uh, I I could have told you the right things to do because I knew all of the right things to say and all the right ways to live. But for me, following Jesus It was just following people who were following him and then trying to match my life to theirs. But God worked in my college years, in my own heart, through my own personal journey with him in such a powerful way that God was leading me in unmistakable ways. It was the first time I felt like God was closing the gap between what I knew and what I was experiencing. It's kind of what Habakkuk is praying in this prayer. God, I've heard of your works. I've heard of your fame. I've heard that you've done great things. God, would you do it in my generation just like you've done it in generations past? And this was so central to the church then that it's got to be so central to our church today. Not that the church becomes about any one personality but that the centrality of God is so foundational to who we are that no matter who's leading, no matter what person is is leading in a ministry, that it never becomes about a personality or one person. We want the one thing that we're about. If someone walks in one time, we want them to see and know Jesus, his fame, his work, everything singled around him, the faithfulness, the power, the presence, the fame of God. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your work, who you are, God, what you do. And let me just give you a peek behind the curtain. This team of staff, all of our stakeholders who've put a stake in the ground and said, this is our church home, our overseers, we're not, we're not just giving our life to some moral idea. This isn't about some religious rabbit's foot that we, that we hold onto and grab onto when things get tough. This is not some spiritual club that we're a part of. 
No, we are fiercely and unapologetically committed to this being about the fame and the work of Jesus. It is why we are driven by the values of intimacy with God, by the value of authenticity with self. Because no matter where we're at, no matter what we're carrying, there's a God who loves us. It's why we're committed to love for each person because we know that every person, regardless of the choices that they're making currently, is made in the image of God. That's why we're committed and driven by the value of the restoration of all things so that we can be the home for the wanderer and rest for the weary. Can I just tell you, I'll show you all of our cards. We're not pursuing religion. We're not pursuing spirituality. We're pursuing Jesus. And because we pursue Jesus, we aren't coming in here with our own agendas, our own dreams, our own personal pet projects or passions. And because we're pursuing Jesus, we get to go before God and ask for great things. It's why the psalmist says in Psalm chapter two, ask of me, God says, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possessions. Matthew chapter seven, as Jesus is wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount, he says, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. The brother of Jesus, James, said it this way in James 4.22, you do not have because you do not ask. We believe. Our staff, we believe. Our overseers, we believe. The stakeholders, the, the families who call this place home, we believe God is not done in this time in history. We see how God moved in times past. We see how God has worked with people in those days, and we believe that God is not done with his movement in the world today. We believe God's not done in our city. We believe God's not done in our community and in our lives, and we won't be content until the fame and the works of God are made known in our time. The name Habakkuk, uh, this Old Testament prophet, a minor prophet tucked into a, a corner of scripture that often doesn't get looked at. Uh, this prophet's name means to wrestle, and wrestle he did with God. He wrestled with God because there was so much to wrestle with that was going wrong in culture and in history. Everything was a wreck. Everything was falling apart. Every person was totally and fully overwhelmed with life. And so Habakkuk cries out to God. And as he prays to God, God not only hears his prayer, but he answers his prayer. If you've ever wondered, does God really care when I pray? Does God really hear when I cry out to him? Look at scripture to be reminded that God does. In Habakkuk chapter one, verse five, God answers Habakkuk's plea with this. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded for I am doing a work in your days that you wouldn't believe if I told you. This is why we're founding and having everything be foundationally on the centrality of God because when God works, when God moves, when the favor of God is on his people and on his church, there's nothing that can stop it. God makes this promise. If I'm gonna do things in your generation that if I told you, you wouldn't even believe, which gives Habakkuk the boldness to pray this. Oh Lord, I've heard a report of you. I love how the message puts it, God, I've heard what our ancestors say about you. And I am stopped in my tracks, down on my knees. Do among us what you did among them. Work among us how you worked among them. And as you bring judgment, as you surely must, remember mercy. What if we prayed like that again? God, we wanna see you move and work and be known in our day and our city. Over the summer, we, we spent the entire summer in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and it was an incredible journey that we didn't even finish yet. We, we just kinda, okay, we're gonna push pause, we're gonna, we're gonna have some vision series and we'll get back to the Sermon on the Mount. But the Sermon on the Mount was Jesus' manifesto, his description of what life in the kingdom looks like. The greatest teacher ever on planet Earth, preaching the greatest sermon ever written on planet Earth, starts to walk through and unpack this idea of life 
in every aspect of life because Jesus covers topic like, topics like the blessed life, like salt and light, like anger and sexual immorality. Jesus walks through marriage and oaths. He talks about retaliation and loving your enemies. He unpacks a, a theology of giving to the poor and praying and fasting and money. Jesus covers anxiety and judging others and bold faith and kindness to people. He talks about eternal life, spiritual fruit. And then Jesus wraps up the entire sermon, this manifesto, this way of life. He wraps up the entire sermon in chapter 7, verse 24, by saying this, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Jesus is shifted into contractor mode here and He's talking about home building, but he's also talking about the storms that come to all of our lives. Those storms that come relationally, when your marriage seems to be spiraling out of control, where the dreams that you had came crumbling down at your feet, where those relationships with your kids aren't as you wished and you dreamed. Uh, where uh, you're seeing child and parent dedications and you're grieving the loss of the relationship with your own kids. Maybe it's the storm that comes to your life is a relationship that never was. The relationship that you've prayed for, that you've begged God for, that still not yet has come. Maybe for you, your storms come financially because you lost your job. You can't seem to find a job. The job that you're in doesn't appreciate you or pay you the value that you know you're worth. Maybe for you, the storms come financially because the stock market is underachieving or your bank account never seems to get to the place that you need it to be. Maybe for you, your storms come physically because you just can't seem to get healthy. And everyone you were around, everywhere you go, nobody would even know some of the physical challenges that you have with your health. But every day is a challenge for you physically. Maybe for you, it's not around, uh, the storms don't come physically with your health. They come physically with how you're expected to show up. And you just try to keep up always with the Joneses, which is a no-win situation in South Orange County, can I just say. Maybe for you, your storms come emotionally when the darkness just doesn't seem to lift. We're getting out of bed, let alone getting out of the house is an overwhelming challenge where you can't seem to avoid the anxiety that always shows up in your life and you just feel overwhelmed and exhausted by what seems like small things for everyone else. Maybe the storms for you come politically. I mean, have you ever seen so much outrage, demonizing of other politicians who, oh, by the way, are also created in the image of God. Fear and contempt and polarization are all around, and there's so much disdain for people just because of what they believe politically. Jesus closes the entire Sermon on the Mount with one singular idea. He distills down all of his teaching to one word, and that one word is practice. Put into practice what you've heard. Take all of my teachings and put them into practice. Then he compares two homes. He says there's one home that's built on a rock. There's one home that's built on sand. And the difference between the two, stability comes, Jesus says, by putting what he says into practice. Listen, there's a lot of great churches in our city. There are a lot of great churches on our street. But there are a lot of people in our community who hear on a Sunday morning the words of Jesus. But Jesus makes this distinction, this delineation. It's not about hearing the words. It's about putting them into practice. Jesus says the Christian life is actually not about words. 
It's not about knowing the certain things to be true. It's not about the answers that we have or don't have. It's all about the way that we live. Because for Jesus, it's always been more about how we live than what we believe. Because you can believe something and not live it. But you cannot live something and not believe it's true. Churches every single Sunday are filled with people who listen to sermons preached every single week. Those people don't honor God with their money. They don't honor God with their bodies and their influence. Jesus mentions in the Sermon on the Mount three practices. When you pray, when you give, when you fast. Jesus doesn't say, hey, if you get around to this spiritual discipline, just remember my words when you, when you eventually do it, if you do it. No, Jesus says, when you do it, because there's an assumption that as followers of Jesus, there are practices that we have that are part of our life. He says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. And yet people listen to sermons every single week and rarely pray throughout the week. We hear the word of God taught week in and week out and yet seldom give to what God's doing. And rarely, if even ever, do we fast. Jesus tells us in the sermon to love and pray for our enemies and people who persecute us. Yet churches are full of people who viciously attack one another on social media and about politics. Is it any wonder that there's a bunch of church people in this very moment that we call the here and now who are anxious and worried and afraid. I think Jesus would lean in to say, listen, you're hearing the word. You're just not doing it. Your foundation is sand. Both of the builders who built on rock and who built on sand, they both heard the same message. Only one practiced it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it this way, one act of obedience is better than a hundred sermons. Thank you for not amening. The brother of Jesus who did life with Jesus, who rubbed shoulders with Jesus, who saw the Jesus who was preaching live things out in practice. This is what James says in James 1, 22. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The brother of Jesus picked up on this very point from the life of Jesus, which means we gotta ask ourselves, am I hearing the word and not putting it into practice? This is why our mission statement here at Mountain View Church is not just home for the wanderer, rest for the weary. Because we're not a people who just show up and wander around and whistle while we work and catch some Z's when we can because we're weary. No, the the full mission of this church is, yes, we are home for the wanderer, rest for the weary, for the reconciliation of all things. So, So hear me loud and clear saying that this is a place that's safe. This is a place that I hope you find rest, but this is a place that we're gonna get busy for Jesus because God is passionate about the reconciliation and the restoration of all things. Theologically, we know that that starts with Jesus, that initiates from Jesus, but that he invites us to be a part of the restoration of all things. And it starts with us living like Jesus. Yes, the restoration of all things comes from Jesus, but it starts with you and I. Being from Tennessee, people ask me all of the time, oh, do you miss living in Tennessee? And honestly, there, there are a few times throughout the year that we do. Uh, fall being one of those, because fall in Tennessee, you get cool, crisp air, you get the changing of the leaves, you get a, a new season, a new weather, and That means the temperature changes, which we need to change this weekend in Jesus' name. In Tennessee, we experience fall weather, but in the fall, we also have uh, a special tradition of going and picking apples in the apple orchard. I don't even know if this is a thing around here. Do we go to orange orchards and pick? I don't know. Uh, I tell my wife every time she wants to do this, I'm like, you know, we can get these things at the grocery store a whole lot cheaper, right? but apparently you can't post that on Instagram, picking apples at the grocery store. But anyway, I digress. We we love taking our kids to go and pick apples, but 
One of the things that we are constantly doing with our kids when we're going to pick apples at an apple orchard is telling them, stop picking apples on the ground. If you've ever gone apple picking, you know that there are people who will take an apple off the tree, take a bite of it, and then drop it. Or you know that some apples will fall naturally from the tree and the bugs will get it, the rodents will get it, and they'll eventually turn brown and they'll start to rot. But if you've got kids and you're going to the apple orchard, that is the defense that you're running. Do not put that in your mouth. And yet, I wonder how often you and I do the same things when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. We're just content to settle with picking apples off the ground. Our, our phrase to our kids is, hey, just look up. There's, there's fresh, crisp, juicy, sweet apples right in front of your eyes. Would you just lift up your eyes? Isn't that what God wants for us as a church? For us to not settle for anything less than the best that he has for us and begin to look up and reframe our focus on who Jesus is, on what he wants for us personally, but also collectively as a family. What he wants for our church is only his best. But how often do we not trust God at his word and just think we know better and settle and spend our lives with rotten apples when God calls us to a vision that is so much greater? And so as we begin to unpack this way, as we begin to look at what God has uniquely called us to here at Mountain View, we have got to begin by looking to Jesus and make sure that we're aiming and hitting the right targets as we align our sights and align our vision with what he wants. Let's pray. God, we are grateful that you have promised us even more than we can imagine the more that we could believe. God, we are grateful that you're not just a promise maker, but you're a promise keeper. And so God, in this moment, would you reframe our our hearts to be captivated by who Jesus is and what he's called us to do. God, we ask that in this moment, you would lay our foundation in such solid ways on who you are and what you've done so that who we are and what we will do will flow from you alone. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.